I'd like to extend a very, very warm welcome to Kim Jared, who's joining us this afternoon to give, if not the London premiere, then close to the London premiere of Himself. your film. Um, I've known Kim roughly about the same length of time than I've known Hillary because Hillary and Kim were next door neighbours and uh, have supported one another in very different ways over nearly 20 years. Kim is going to introduce the film, uh, which we're then going to see, uh, and then she and I are going to talk about it. So, Kim Jarrett, please. Thank you very much, Ian, for the introduction. I'm going to read, because I'm not really accustomed to public speaking, so forgive me if I have notes and just read straight. I'm thrilled to be here at this event and be able to show you a film that I made kind of accidentally. I live in Woking in Surrey with my husband and two children. My Baby is my first film. I didn't make a conscious decision to make a film. I really had no idea that I was going to. I'd often thought I quite fancy making one, a bit like when people say they've got a book inside of them. But I never really knew what to make a film about, never really knew what my story would be. And then one day, I found I did have a story to tell. It's almost three years since our eldest child, our 10-year-old daughter, told us she lift, wished to live as a boy. I'd be lying if I said it was a complete surprise, because there'd be many clues which I'd tried to brush away. But it's still an enormous thing to get our heads around when the words were finally said. Mummy, I feel like a boy inside. For years and years, I'd been the mother of a girl, and with that had assumed all kinds of futures for my daughter, and dreamed the dreams that mothers often dream. Girly shopping trips, sharing secrets about first boyfriends, watching them get married, knitting for their babies. To be fair, with the extreme tomboy we now lived with, didn't really look like things were heading that way at all. But a mum can still dream. Perhaps it was just a tomboy phase. Looking back, I felt quite stupid. I hadn't seen what was right before my eyes. My daughter transitioned to living as a boy rapidly at her request. After all, she'd been waiting a long time to do it, three to four years, in her words. Three to four years during which, it seemed, we'd all been unknowingly living a bit of a lie. Almost immediately, we bought new boy clothes. The already short hair became very short hair. Within four, four months, she was a full-time boy with new pronouns and a new name. It was quite astonishing how quickly it all happened once the floodgates had been opened. I've read plenty of discussions and disagreements about parents being overly permissive in these circumstances or even rushing their children through the process at an unacceptable speed. Lots of people seem to have lots of opinions, mostly people who have never been through it, I might add. But I can tell you, when your child tells you something so monumental and with such clarity, you listen and you listen hard. To suggest that parents could push a child down this trickiest of paths is unthinkable. The things my child told me that have been going around in their head demonstrated a depth of self-awareness which was frankly breathtaking. We had no reason to doubt what he was feeling and let him lead the way at his own pace. He forged his own path with great courage and never once has looked back or faltered, despite the many challenging situations he's had to face. So now we had two sons and no daughter. To say it was overwhelming would be an understatement. We were feeling completely out of our depth. Whilst relieved at finally being who he wanted to be, our son sobbed often at night, wishing he had a different body, threatening to cut parts off and desperate to grow a beard. We played amateur therapists as best we could. Apart from wholeheartedly supporting him, we didn't really know what to do next. Actual professional help for transgender children is very hard to access. The current waiting time for being seen at the Gender Identity Service at the Tavistock is 20 months. I'm going to repeat that, 20 months for an initial appointment. At the same time, as at the time we were referred, it was a 10-month wait, which was still a very, very long time when a child, we had a child in need. 
We owe a huge debt of thanks to the charity Mermaids, who are our greatest support during this time. We were able to go on a residential weekend where we met other families with transgender children. And finally, we didn't feel so alone. My son was thrilled to meet other transgender children of all ages and was able to be himself free, uninhibited, and without worrying whether he passed as a boy or not. Whilst I was 100% supportive of all my son was going through, inside, I was struggling hugely with the enormity of the change that had happened. My feelings were very complex and mixed up about the past and the future. About eight months after he had made his announcement about his true feelings, I got up very early one morning. I literally had no idea I was going to do this, but I started to write a poem. I've never written poetry in my life before. I clearly had the need to offload some thoughts. The words poured out of me and they wouldn't stop until I'd written the story from beginning to end. A week later, I read it out to a group of friends, and as I did so, I realised I was seeing moving pictures alongside it. Before I'd even voiced that, a very wise friend said something along the lines of, that'd make a really beautiful film. And thus, a ball started to roll. Within a few months, a friend had put me in touch with my producer, Andy Linfield, and with his guidance, I'd written a script of sorts. He put together a small team to work with, we cast the parts, and I threw out a plea to family and friends to help me fund the crazy idea of making a film. Seven months after I wrote that poem, on a tiny budget, we shot the film locally in a weekend. It was possibly the most terrifying and stressful two days of my whole entire life. Flying by the seat of my pants would be a good way of explaining it. I assumed naively that once the careful plans were in place, it would all go smoothly but so many things did not go to plan. I had literally no idea how to direct a film, and I was performing the jobs of about 10 people. But I did have a clear vision in my head, and somehow we managed to do it. I'm eternally grateful for the gift of Anna Nunes, my cinematographer, who captured the essence of what I wanted so beautifully and worked so hard with the editing to get the final cut the way I wanted it. Additionally, I was blessed with a beautiful cast who, without fuss, took my haphazard instructions and pulled off great performances in front of the camera. We did it, and I'm so proud of what we've achieved. Over the last couple of years, one of the things my son and I have done is connect with other people in the transgender community. We went to our first Pride in London a year after he transitioned. We took part in the parade, marching with other families and their children. It was frankly a complete game changer in the way my son perceived himself. Before Pride, he felt an outsider. He didn't really fit anywhere and he felt different. At Pride, we found there was not only acceptance out there in the world and a huge amount of support, but even better, and I believe this to be the most important factor, there was actual celebration of difference. My 11-year-old son paraded, sang, even danced through the crowded streets. He waved his big transgender flag, he high-fived people and he embraced people in the crowds. It was very emotional as a parent to watch. Here I could see plainly in action the reason Pride celebrations exist. Pride empowered him, made him feel everything ultimately could be okay in his world. His future looked brighter as he felt connected to his community. In a world which is not always kind and tolerant, being able to celebrate who you are can make a whole lot of difference to yourself as esteem and identity. I hope that what I've created brings a deeper and more compassionate understanding on the subject of transgender children and their families. I challenge people whilst watching the film to think about their own current assumptions about the trans community and trans children and gender in general and where these assumptions may have come from. Do those around you in your work have the same or different assumptions? And are there things you might want to think about differently as you move forward? And now I'd like to introduce my accidental film, My Baby. I hope you enjoy it.
precious girl, blue eyes, blonde hair, sweet cherub face, smile turned to the sun, crept into our hearts, lighting a longed for fire. I parented hard, mummied fierce. Dream big, baby girl. Be who you are. Have confidence. Shine your light. Never let anyone get in your way. But underneath, quiet expectations. Play this, wear that, present yourself well, don't play so rough. Frustration, I don't understand. Things seem off course, the future blurred. Sweet girl, why do you resist so? Mummy longs for the best for you. Dresses shunned bit by bit. Gentle persuasion hits a wall. Determination through gritted teeth to present a certain way to the world. Body changing as you grow bigger. Dismay at approaching womanhood. Naive mummy holds you close. There, there, little one. Growing up is tough. Something's not right, but what? Extreme tomboy fills the air, but it's more, much more. I can't put my finger on it. Then, the bombshell. I'm not who you think I am. I'm sorry, I tried to be who I was, but I can't hold it in anymore. Sweet girl, you are so brave. You found the words and strength. Come baby, let me hold you. I'm so sorry, I didn't understand. Being a mummy isn't like this. Heart ruptured in an instant. The dream that was collapsed, the future so unclear. Now a truth beholds, a plan unfolds. Secrets finally spilled, whispers of the true person beneath. The past drops into place, what we fail to see. Guilt for being so sightless when you were screaming your truth. This is what I want to wear and who I want to be. permission for the craved short hair. That shirt, buttoned just right. New clothes a witness to secret plans, concealed in an unfaltering mind. Quietly unleashed now, the joy is indisputable. An honest tide gushes, it's been waiting too long. I can't keep up with this boy, who can't wait for me. I'm marching forth, Mum. See me shine, watch me grow. I'm certain, but also scared. Hold me, Mummy, 
help me. See me now, everyone. Here I am, the new me. Yet still the old me. Will you stand by this boy? Yes, yes, comes the answer. You are loved. You are special. Whoever you are, come out and be. Happiness and acceptance, the relief of support. But in its wake, Mummy aches, sobbing an endless river. No more, precious girl. The past seems a dream, a puff of smoke that mocks the reality. Photos shriek the past. Reminiscences assault the eyes. Everywhere, mementos of someone still present. There is only forward, no reverse. Yearning the past is futile. I stare into this boy's eyes and search for what he holds inside. Your dreams contradict mine and take unexpected turns. Reach for what you yearn for, without losing yourself. We adjust whilst you transform. Beautiful boy, take your time. It feels like breathing underwater, floating, sinking, floating, whilst I wait in limbo for my boy to find where he wants to be.
Fine boy, you amaze me. You are soaring beyond the stars. I'm here forever for the ride, my precious blue-eyed son. Um, thank you, Kim, for sharing that story, your story. We thought it would be important to explore gender identity and transitioning uh, with an audience which is largely dedicated to educating young people in school communities which are defined by gender. Kim and I are going to discuss some commonplace assumptions around gender identity and transitioning, and there'll be an opportunity afterwards to ask a few questions. Kim... I was watching the audience reaction, um, my reaction. Surely a child isn't old enough to know? Um, I think this is a common assumption, misconception, um, and I probably might have agreed with you uh, before my son came out. Um, however, I've met many, many children now and many children who are much, much younger than my son. I've met uh, three and four-year-olds that are very definitely, literally saying, why are you calling me a boy? I'm, I feel like a girl, I am a girl, what? You know, they're genuinely confused by um, being called the, what they perceive the wrong gender. Um, and they can be so unhappy living in the wrong gender um, at their age, or as my son was, um, at 10. Um, and then when they transition, if you allow them to be who they want to be, sometimes the change can be completely like, just like a different child. Um, my son was um, the same. He, there was just something not, not right going on with him and I just couldn't put my finger on it. As I said in the film, it was just, I mean, like I said in my speech, I felt quite stupid um, really in the end because I thought, why don't I think that just wasn't on my radar. Um, but there were so many things and looking back at old photos now, I mean, it's screamingly obvious the clothes choices he made and the, and the things he wanted to do. Um, so it was a complete change for him, and I've seen that in other children as well. So I, I don't think you can be too young to decide who you absolutely are. Mm. I guess the idea that <clears throat> this will never happen to us um, is another assumption, um, not just as parents, but as educators. Um, is there a danger in, in complacency? What, what should we do? Um, I think I didn't think it would happen to me. Um, it wasn't something that was on my radar at all. And um, as, we can, as we can see now, it is uh, it's becoming a lot more common. People are becoming a lot more um, brave about coming out. Um, if they, if it's going to happen to some some of you somewhere in your career, um, if it hasn't already, um, it's only going to be a matter of time. Um, I think. Firstly, when a child tells you something so massive, you believe them and you take them seriously. Um, they won't be saying it just for fun. Um, it takes huge courage for children to actually come out and say that. Some children are um, 
was saying it earlier, some children hold it for a very, very long time inside them um, before they finally say it. Um, sometimes when they tell you it's like a penny drops, it certainly was for me, it was like, ha, huh, now I get it, <laughs> now I understand. Um, so if a child comes to you and says something like that, you might already go, hmm, I suspected something like this. Um, you need to put your own personal feelings aside if a child comes to you and, and, and discloses to you um, their true feelings. Um, you should feel very flattered that a child um, trusted you enough as a person, as an individual, to come and say those things to you. Um, and you need to acknowledge that to them, how, how courageous and how brave they are in actually saying those words out loud. You may be the first person they've ever told. Um, it's not a safeguarding issue. Um, and in schools, you should have some kind of policy. I think there's a, a lot of confusion about what those policies should be in school. Um, there's training out there um, that you can bring into schools. And there are lots of organizations that do training. Um, Anna, down here in the front, is from Diversity Role Models. And they take training into schools um, for teachers and for students. Um, and she and I were chatting earlier, and she was saying that she really thinks it, it would be beneficial to have a, a named person for diversity in every school, um, somebody that can be trained. So there's always at least one person in the school that's got training on um, LGBT issues. Parental pressure. Um, as a parent, and as a particular kind of parent, um, what do you notice about other parents that you meet and their concern? What's the balance between concern and encouragement? Fortunately for us, we've had very good experiences. I haven't really had any issues with people um, being concerned for us or our child, apart from uh, a couple of family members who found it quite a struggle. Um, There's a lot of support out there. People are very supportive. Children are especially supportive. Children just take it on board. They're all very open, um, open to, to change, to diversity generally. Um, nobody has questioned my son when he finally came out. Um, they all said, oh, well, that's, he was like a boy anyway. Like, what's the big deal? He dressed like a boy. He played all the rough and tumble games. He had short hair. Like, well, what's, well, why didn't you? Why didn't you twig it? We've all twigged it already. Um, there's, there's a lot of misinformation in the media about um, pressure from parents on children, like that, that children are being pressured by parents to change, um, which is frankly nonsense. All of you work with children, and presumably some of you are also parents. Um, it's difficult enough to force a child to eat a fork full of peas. Um, if you think that you can force a child to change their gender, to dress up in clothes of the opposite gender and go out to school or in the world to face the ridicule. I mean, you must be mad. I just, no, nobody could force their child to do this. Um, the media likes to portray um, this as some kind of thing that parents want their child for, to do this for attention and all kinds of nonsense. Um, it's just, it's all, it's all nonsense. Um, the media also likes to uh, tell the story that children are being fast-tracked through the NHS system to get all sorts of gender-changing um, drugs. Um, and if you talk to anyone with a transgender child, they'll probably laugh in your face at the idea of anybody being fast-tracked through the NHS system. Um, as I said in my talk, 20 months to even get an initial appointment. Um, and that's up-to-date information off their website last night. Um, and even then, when you get through their doors, you have to undergo a lengthy assessment, um, which can range, depending on your therapist, um, between six months to a year. So there's no fast-tracking of anything going on um, at all. If anything, it's, it, uh, the NHS are very reluctant to um, diagnose anything, let alone refer you for any sort of treatment. So fast tracking, you know, once it's done, that's it. Um, through unnecessary medical procedures, um, deciding on one's gender, sort of end of story, happily ever after, because there's a, a narrative which is continuing. Um, doesn't stop with what stopped in the film. Mm. 
How do you tackle that? Um, well, it's easy to think that once they've transitioned, that's, that's it. They, you know, swan off into the future, happy, happy. Um, the actual living peaceably with that is quite hard um, for adults, transgender adults and for children. Um, I'm sort of focusing on the children's aspect, obviously. Um, for my son, continuing to pass as a boy every day is a really, really stressful thing for him. He's continually um, worried that people are going to out him or he's going to out himself by... You know, we have our huge issues. We always had issues over clothes for one reason. Now we've got issues over clothes because they might show his chest. He's 13 now. Sport is difficult, swimming, things like that, for, um, for both um, ways of transitioning female to male or male to female. You've got bits that will give you away in a swim costume. Um, lots of children, you know, my son actually is fairly... Um, not happy with his body, but he's, he tolerates his body as it is. Um, but many children do not. Um, they're living with bits on their body that they absolutely hate. They just can't stand them. Um, children bathe and have showers with their underwear on because they cannot bear um, to see those bits. Um, you know, there's bullying that goes on. Um, there's, there, a lot of them are very anxious, some children self-harm. Once you've transitioned, it's, that's not it. Um, you're, you're constantly living with, with the fear of being outed um, and, and people knowing. Um, I, just, I did have a little bit that I took out of my speech um, because I wasn't sure whether to say it or not, but as, as the morning's gone on, I've decided that I will, will say it. Um, so we, you might ask, since we're at an educational conference, you might ask how my son coped at school. Um, he doesn't actually go to school because we home educate. So fortunately, this isn't something we've had to navigate. And I say fortunately, because from our own observations of his many trans friends, most, if not all, of their day-to-day -day difficulties stem from the school environment. Um, some children are withholding eating and drinking all day because, they're, because they don't want to use the toilet, either because they're not permitted to use the toilet of their chosen gender, or they've been bullied when they do use them. Um, there are children whose pronouns are deliberately disregarded on a daily basis by their peers and, disappointingly, often their teachers. And that term, in case you don't know, is called misgendering. Um, and they can suffer verbal and physical abuse um, at the hands of their peers. And of course, there are wonderful examples of best practice going on in some schools where um, trans children are beautifully supported to be themselves, but sadly, that appears to be few and far between. Um, and like I say, I wasn't going to say that, but as the day's gone, I thought, nope, I'm going to put that out there and say it. They're a lovely audience, so I'm <laughs> glad you could say that. Um, the final assumption. Kim, is that the trans community is one that's well supported. Mermaids, Tavistock, the Pride event you talked about. Is that so? Um, in some ways, yes. In many ways, no. Um, so just in case people aren't um, aware, the Tavistock, Tavistock um, general gender identity service at the Tavistock is pretty much the only place you can go to on the NHS for help. Um, whereas Mermaids is a charity organisation, so there's a, a difference there. Um, there's a massive backlog, as I've mentioned, at the Tavistock. Um, they are supportive to an extent. Um, they are also the gatekeepers of your treatment for your child. Um, and depending on your therapist, we've been very lucky we've had good therapists who do keep changing because there's a massive turnover of staff in the service. Um, depending on your therapist, you, they may or may not decide that you may have things like puberty blockers, um, which many children want to suppress their pu puberty, which is a reversible drug, so um, there's nothing permanent going on. It's not sex change or gender change. It's just suppressing their puberty, which a lot of children find comforting to just have everything stopped. Um, so Tavistock is supportive when you finally get there, um, but it's a massive wait. Um, and also, 
just recently I've been sort of questioning what we're going for. What, what, you know, what, what are we doing here? We, we aren't having blockers um, by my son's choice. Um, the only reason really at the moment why we're staying in the service is because if, you, when we, if he wants to go on to cross sex homes and we want to be referred to the adult services, we can, be, we can um, be referred quite quickly into adult services. If you're not in the service already as a child, um, you, the waiting time to be seen as an adult is three years. So we're sticking with it at the moment so that it, when we want to get transferred over, it'll be um, quick. There's massive support out there from charities such as Mermaid, Gendered Intelligence, um, Gyres, all of those are um, poorly funded. Um, Mermaids had a horrible thing happen last year where they had um, £500,000 of national lottery funding put on hold thanks to a hate campaign on Mumsnet, um, which has fortunately been um, uh, confirmed now that they will get it. Um, so they're desperately trying to do, do the right thing and support people. It's the only support you can get, really, while you're in the wait for the Tavistock. Um, because there's nothing else to do while you're waiting for an initial appointment. Um, they're amazing, they're invaluable, um, they get a lot of stick in the media, very, very unfairly. Um, Susie Green, who's the CEO, is the most amazing, wonderful person, but the portrayal she gets in the media is literally shocking. She's had death threats and all sorts. It just breaks my heart because, you know, it's just parents need support, they need people to offload to, they need other parents to talk to so you don't feel so alone. They run residentials, which I talked about in my talk, was just wonderful for my son to go. At the, at the time we went, he'd never met another transgender child. He thought he was the only one. He just didn't know there were loads of other children out there. Um, so it was massive for him to go and, and meet other children and just be normal and not have to worry all the time that he was passing as a boy or not. Um, so, yeah, there is support out there. You just don't read mainstream media. Um, don't read the Daily Fail. Don't read the Sun. Um, don't even read the Sunday Times. There's, there's, uh, stick to alternative media um, and stick to hearing it from people who are actually going through it. Um, the nonsense that's in the media is shocking. Okay. One last question, Kim, before we throw it open to the audience. What would you like to have come from today? given the conversations that you've had and the way that you've clearly been responded to so brilliantly? Um, I guess I'd like people to have empathy for trans children and their, and their families. Um, there's so much judgment out there. They just need holding and being believed um, and being supported. Um, it break, breaks my heart when I hear of children not being supported um, by their families sometimes um, or by, by anybody. I mean, just, I've, I've seen it firsthand what it does to the children when they're bullied, when they're, you know, and that can be in school or kind of on the way to school, um, you know, just in, out in public. It just, it crushes them. They're just normal children that just want to peaceably get on with their lives. Um, in the way that they want to, and it seems so hard for them to do that. Um, so I just I want people to have compassion and understanding for them and their families. Okay, Kim, thank you again. <laughs> Who has a question? Anna. Can I ask how your husband and other son coped with this and, and the dynamics? how it changed the dynamics within the whole family? That's a very good, good question and something that I realised I hadn't covered when I was reading my notes earlier. Um, my husband has been fully on board. Um, we've been, been on the same page completely. Um, my younger son has struggled a lot. Um, he was very, very supportive, um, and he is still supportive, and I think would, um, you know, fight over anybody that bullied his older brother. However, he was the only boy in the family um, until there was another boy. And never mind the fact that he was an elite gymnast, very strong, very talented in his own field, my elder son is, has always been a lot more confident, a lot more dominant, um, and just bigger. Um, and very early on, the very first con conversation I think I had with my younger son um, about it, he was very clear that he felt like he'd had something stolen 
from him. His role in the family as the boy in the family had been stolen from him. You know, the things that he did with daddy, rightly or wrongly, going down the field to play football. And you thought, well, it's not just me and daddy anymore. He felt very undermined and very threatened, and he still does um, now. There's a lot of conflict between them, which is something we're having to work through. Um, and it, it, it breaks my heart because, you know, he's, he's wonderfully talented in his own way, but he just sees his older brother as more dominant. And unfortunately, he is, he's a lot more confident than he is more dominant. Um, that's just how it is. But he really does, he has suffered from that. That's a good question. I just wondered what your hopes are for the film itself, whether, um, because it was so moving, I know I, I had tears in my eyes and I know a lot of people did, I thought it was superb, so well Thank done, um, but just wondered what your hopes are for the future for the film, because talking obviously in a room of educators, I think it'd be fantastic for kids to see that film so yeah. that they could understand more. That's really good feedback because I've, I've never been quite sure how other children would take it, whether it was too mature um, and to, because it's from the mother's angle, whether it was something they would comprehend. So that's really good feedback. I, ha I just, I've taken it to film festivals, um, which is, if you don't know, the film festival circuit sort of a sort of, they call it festivals, it's really competitions, you submit your films into various festivals and they might get picked or they might not. So I've, I've done a raft of um, festivals, um, we've, it's been shown at two, I'm hoping it's going to have a few more this year, I'm just waiting for notifications to hear. Um, I, I quite like doing things like this, actually, um, kind of face to face with people uh, and explaining the background to the film a little bit more, so um, I don't think it's going to be a, you know, winning an Oscar. And, uh, I hope it will reach people that need to, um, educators, other parents, um, just reach people who need to understand, anybody. Next question. Yes. Um, you said that some schools are deal dealing really well with gender transition, so what are the things that you've seen that are working really well? Um, I think they're n not singling them out, um, they're just generally supporting them very well, lots of... Um, kind of nurture, um, lots of space for them to, to talk to somebody. Um, they're letting them use the bathroom, the toilet um, that they want to use. They're not being told they have to use the disabled toilet or the staff toilet. Um, they're allowed to change with their peers. They're allowed to do, the, do sport with the right um, gender group if they've got gender segregated sports. Um, and they're coming down hard on bullying um, and they're um, embracing training for their staff and um, for the children, or the, the students also. Anna, do you want to say anything about what Diversity Role Models is, is able to do? Anna. Um, so Diversity Role Models is a charity that was actually funded by a teacher um, after she uh, uh, saw news reports of a child being bullied uh, due to being gay and then took his own life and after that his father also took his life because he couldn't cope. That's why our charity was funded. And um, we go into schools mainly delivering student workshops, explaining what LGBT plus means and why it's never okay to bully anyone and why it's not okay to say that's so gay when you hate your maths assignment. Um, we also do uh, staff training uh, because I, uh, having been uh, to uni to be a high school teacher, have never had any training on that whatsoever and a lot of staff I have met also experience the same. So we do staff training, we do governor training and parent and carer workshops. Um, we have now a fully funded program which focuses on SLT consultancy and staff training. Sadly, only in some areas of London there are flyers on the uh, tables. Um, we're always happy to um, help people with um, bespoke workshops or bespoke training if they need to and to answer any sorts of questions. We always take role models in to talk about their lived experience as part of the LGBT community or as allies and then people have the ability, uh, the, the chance to ask anonymous questions and it's always wonderful and very interesting what comes up.
Thank you. Kim, any final thoughts before we, we pause? You have okay. talked about another film. Uh, yes. I'm not quite sure what next film would be. I've, since I've made a film, I st start thinking about any issue um, in my life and think, oh, well, I'll make that into a film. Oh, I can make that into a film. Um, I've got all sorts of ideas kind of floating around. Whether I've got the time to execute them, I don't know. Um, I would like to make another film. Um, I'd like to make one on a bigger budget so that I'm not doing all the roles myself. You know when you see um, in films they have all those hundreds of assistants and this, that and the other, you know, you think, oh, for goodness sake, all oh, these people, did they really take all those people? Well, I know now, now no, <laughs> what all those people do, because I was doing all, the, all of their jobs on one day, or two days. Well, thank you so much for coming today and sharing that thank story, you. your thank story, you. with us. Thank you again. Kim Jarrett. <laughs>